everybody. Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared and today, Saturday, July 22nd, Jerusalem is under siege. This is a picture from today in Jerusalem and it's under siege. And for all the work that I do to try and keep on top of events and watch for signs of the times, I didn't even, this thought didn't even really cross my mind until I got this comment. This is from David Ramos. Uh, he was responding to my recent video, Tisha B'Av is next week. And we were exploring how Tisha B'Av may relate to uh, the second coming. And he said, due to the recent events in Israel, uh, it could be the start of the siege of Jerusalem. So many, th so many ongoing things that could lead to this. It, it could last a few months and the Lord could appear to the Jews during Rosh Hashanah. And, uh, I had not really thought about, because in the, in that video, I was, uh, part of it, we were talking about these, uh, protests, the judicial reform protests that have been going on for 28 weeks in Israel. And most recently, uh, a ton of protesters, um, you know, did this kind of like gimmick thing where they marched from Tel Aviv all the way to Jerusalem. And now they're there. They're in the city right now as we speak. And uh, it just made me think, you know what? Maybe there's something to this. I just kind of like, I felt it. Um, of course, this is just not even necessarily my opinion. I'm just watching. I'm just considering, you know, could this be it? Could this be the beginning of it? Meaning the final siege of Jerusalem in the final war. And you might be like, well, the final war, you know... We haven't seen that yet. I'm Don't worry, I'm going to cover it all. Some of this is going to be review. But what I want to do is I want to show you what's going on in Israel right now really quick. And then I want to talk about uh, color revolutions. And then after that, I want to read... Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to read the whole chapter, but at least part of this chapter from Bruce R. McConkie's <clears throat> The Millennial Messiah, The Second Coming of the Son of Man, chapter 39, called Jerusalem and Armageddon. And then... Um, you know, after having talked about the color revolutions, what's going on in Israel, we're also going to point out some other things that have happened in Israel that line up with what he says here. Uh, things that I didn't realize before that are in the news. And uh, it's interesting his wording in some of these things. So this is going to be a good video. OK, so let's start with Jerusalem <clears throat> times of Israel. Tens of thousands of demonstrators reached Jerusalem after multi-day march to save democracy, to quote-unquote save democracy. Protesters taking part in the march to Jerusalem have reached the entrance to the city, having set out on Tuesday night in an effort to quote-unquote save democracy by halting the passage of the first bill in the coalition's judicial overhaul package. Again, I would just like to remind you, you know, <clears throat> what you have in Israel right now are people that were elected by the people of Israel. And there's a portion of that society that doesn't like that. So they feel that the right way uh, to affect the law and, uh, and to do democracy is to stop bills from going through forcibly through protests and strikes and stuff like that. They're looking to save democracy. Part of Route One is blocked due to the large number of demonstrate. <clears throat> sorry, due to the large number of demonstrators arriving at the capital with police guarding them. Here's another picture of them. Jerusalem. Tens of thousands of anti-overhaul marchers approach Jerusalem <clears throat> from the Cords Bridge at Jerusalem's entrance. The protesters are set to march to the Knesset. Uh, that's essentially their the equivalent of our Capitol building where uh, Congress meets, where they will rally as the final votes on the quote-unquote reasonable, reasonableness bill are held in the coming days. Some 72,000 people are taking part in the march, according to an, uh, an estimation by the Crowd Solutions firm cited by Channel 13 News. The march began with a small group in Tel Aviv. All right, and that's it for this article. So you have people, um, Israelis, that are, uh, you know, laying siege to the city, in a sense. The Jerusalem Post, 
March arrives in Jerusalem as judicial reform protests begin across Israel. Uh, the march was joined by opposition leader Yair Lapid, and Lapid was already he he was the former right before Netanyahu. He was the former um, prime minister of Israel. He's the one that him with Naftali Bennett they were the two that had an agreement to uh, Naftali Bennett have the first half of the term, uh, and then Yair Lapid have the second half of the term as prime minister because everyone was just trying to get rid of Netanyahu. And so they put together this weird coalition. They successfully did it, but then it fell apart. But anyway, he is out there. The former prime minister of Israel is with these people. So this isn't just like, um, you know, just inconsequential people. There's, there's powerful people among them. Okay, protests begin across the country in the evening. As the march reached Jerusalem, protests began, began in Tel Aviv, Haifa, Ramat Hasharon, Nis Ziona, and elsewhere. Demonstrators waved flags and blocked roads as they did every Saturday night for, 20, for 28 weeks before. So it's not just in Jerusalem, it's throughout the entire country, although you have this uh, dramatic, <clears throat> dramatic thing taking place in Jerusalem proper. Uh, with this uh, march, this siege of the city. Okay, Times of Israel. Anti-overhaul protesters reached Jerusalem after multi-day march to quote-unquote save democracy. Okay, here they are again, uh, blocking most of the highway. Thousands of protesters uh, blocked Tel Aviv's uh, Ibn Givarol as rallies held nationwide. Now, this is a new development. This is 12 minutes ago at the time that I'm recording this. Nearly 500 military intel reservists suspend volunteer service to protest overhaul. I believe this is in addition to all the people in the Air Force, pilots and such, um, as well as um, some elite units that decided to suspend their duty, to not show up uh, for duty in protest, in solidarity with the protesters. So now there's 500 more, these time intelligence uh, reservists. Histadrut chief told uh, to hold emergency meeting tonight amid calls for a general strike. So here we go again. Uh, the like a strike, I think similar to this one, is what essentially stalled um, the whole judicial reform from going forward <clears throat> because they were successful enough at shutting down major parts of the country to where they're like, okay, fine, fine, we'll talk about it. But now here we are um, several months later, and now it looks like, like I've said before, it's round two. The History Dude says the Labor Federation's chief, Arnon Bar-David, will hold an emergency meeting at 9.30 as he faces calls from opponents of the judicial overhaul to declare a general strike to stop the reasonableness bill from being passed. So I guess we'll we'll see if that comes into fruition. Uh, student protesters set up Tent City and Park next to Knesset. There it is. Coalition officials vow to pass overhaul bill as planned if no agreement reached. So one way or another, it seems like this bill is going to go through. Let's see. Tens of thousands of demonstrators reached Jerusalem as multi-day march uh, to save after multi-day march to save democracy. Um, now, this is uh, particularly concerning. I think anti-overhaul protesters rally near Galan's house, urge him to stop over overhaul bill. So, this is the Minister of Defense. Opponents of the judicial overhaul rally outside Defense Minister Yoav Galan's home in Imakam, urging him to call the uh, call to halt the reasonableness bill that the coalition that the coalition is on track to pass into law in the coming days. Television reports last night said Galan was working to push off next week's vote due to growing protests and opposition in the military, with over a 1,000 Air Force reservists announcing yesterday they will suspend their volunteer service to protest the judicial overhaul. We'll add to that another 500. And um, remember, the last time that this happened, he did a televised um, 
press statement uh, without Netanyahu knowing, saying that, hey, this needs to end because it's affecting the military. And so I don't know what he's going to do this time. Uh, at least right now we know that he's like wanting them to go ahead and push it off. But these protesters are essentially appealing to him to do something as the Minister of Defense. You know, I, now, does that mean does that mean that he's going to listen to him? Probably not. I don't know. But he's one that we'll have to watch uh, simply because of what he did last time. <clears throat> OK, excuse me. Former security chiefs back reserve soldiers threatening to stop volunteer service. Dozens of former senior security officials, including ex-heads of the IDF, Mossad, and Shin Bet, send a letter to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calling him to halt the judicial overhaul legislation to allow for renewed talks while expressing support for reservists who have threatened to stop volunteering in protest. How can you support anyone in the military uh, suspending their their duties or uh, showing up to work, especially if you are ahead of the IDF, the Mossad, which is their CIA in Shin Bet. In the letter, the security chiefs say they told Netanyahu <clears throat> they hold Netanyahu quote directly responsible for the serious harm end quote to Israel's security. Uh, uh, well, how, how about the reservists and these people that are stepping away from duty? Why, why don't we hold them directly responsible? Because they're the ones that are actually stepping away um, from their places of duty. While accusing him of, quote, completely ignoring the harm to Israel's democracy, end quote, from the legislation. Quote, the legislative process violates the social contract that has existed in existed for 75 years between thousands of reserve commanders and soldiers. They write, while calling the reservist threats, quote, an act of national responsibility for defending Israeli de democracy. Well, there's not going to be an Israeli democracy to save if uh, the country is invaded or destroyed. Uh, that's your job. OK, continuing, we expect you to take responsibility. We veterans of Israel's wars feel like on the eve of the Yom Kippur War, and are holding up a bright red stop sign before you and your government. Uh, the signatories include IDF chiefs Ehud Barak, who he was also a prime minister of Israel at one point, and then it has the names of all these other people. Uh, police to shutter roads in Jerusalem over coming day due to uh, anti-overhaul protests. All right, and then um, I think that's pretty much it from that article. And then here's just another one uh, saying coalition officials vowed to pass overhaul bill as planned if no agreement reached. So something interesting is going to be happening pretty soon. Something pretty interesting. Now, um, again, back to the question. Well, these are just protests. This isn't the, the war. This isn't the siege that was prophesied of. That has to include tanks and helicopters and missiles and nuclear bombs. It has to be a conventional warfare, the way that we think of war warfare. Um, that may be, you know, it, it, that might be how things turn out, but it might not. And you might be like, well, these are Israeli citizens. There aren't any foreign nations involved in this uh, because the final war, all nations are going to be against Israel. It's going to be several countries invading Israel. Well, uh, let's take a look at that, shall we? Uh, is this uh, all just Isra purely Israeli? Is this like an organic thing? It's an internal affair. It sprung up just naturally among Israeli Israelis. I'm not so sure about that. And I'll show you why. I've already gone over this. I'm not going to read this again because I've already read it like several times. I have some new things to support this idea. But this, if you want to read this later, I'll put it in the description below. This is from Center for Strategic and International Studies, Russia and the Color Revolution, um, in which there was a defense conference and they were talking about in Russia and they were talking about the problem of color revolutions. But let's read a few new things. Serbia and Russia pledge to combat color revolutions. This is from the Associated Press. And uh, this is from December 3rd, 2021. Belgrade, Serbia. Serbia and Russia pledge Friday to combat popular revolutions known as color revolutions. 
that the country's top security officials describe as instruments of the West to destabilize free states, according to a statement issued by Serbia's interior minister. So what are some examples of this? Well, there's a there's a Wikipedia article um, about color revolutions, and it lists a few. Uh, for example, in Serbia, Georgia, uh, Ab Abkhazia, Ukraine, which really, uh, in my view, the reason why there is a war in Ukraine is because there was a, co a color revolution going on, and it was successful. And it got rid of the prime minister of Ukraine, who uh, was in support of Russia. And so they got rid of him through color revolution. And uh, ever since that time, that that's what started this whole thing with Russia going and annexing Crimea, and now the Ukraine war that's going on. The result of a of a color revolution, in my view. Um, Kyrgyzstan, Kyr, oh my gosh, Kyrgyzstan, um, unsuccessful protests, Belarus, Moldova, um, Russia, China. So there's a whole there's a whole list. And here's like an interesting part of this article where it says a pat the pattern for revolution. Michael McFall. Uh, identified seven stages of successful political revolutions common in color revolutions. One, a semi-autocratic rather than fully autocratic regime. Two, an unpopular incumbent. So in this case, it would be Netanyahu. Uh, there's a lot of people that are upset at him. Number three, a united and organized opposition. Uh, four, an ability to quickly drive home the point that, well, I'm not going to say this, but you can read it. Otherwise, I'll get in trouble. Uh, five, enough independent media to inform, to quote unquote, inform citizens about the, eh, how, eh. uh, six, a political opposition capable of mobilizing tens of thousands or more demonstrators to protest, blah, 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 uh, division among the regime's coercive forces. Um, and aren't we seeing that right now in Israel, a division among the Israeli, uh, IDF? Yeah, we see that. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with uh, this. Um, although, I don't know if there's some that are saying that, that Netanyahu shouldn't be there, that it was, uh, you know, whatever. But I think that you can apply this pattern uh, pretty much to anything. I, I think that's what the George Floyd protests were all about. Um, I think that's what the protests in Iran were all about and protests elsewhere. I think that's what the Arab Spring was all about, which it was a really uh, big, really incredible thing that happened where you had a rash of supposedly organic uh, revolutions and rebellions take place all within a very short amount of time across North Africa and the Middle East. Color revolutions. So going back to this, okay, <clears throat> another sign of growing ties between Serbia and Russia Serbian Interior Minister Alexander Vulin met Nikolai Patrushev, the powerful secretary of the Kremlin's Security Council, in Monday on Friday. Quote, It was pointed out at the meeting that the color revolutions have become a traditional policy instrument of certain centers of power in countries aimed at undermining statehood and losing sovereignty under the pretext of democratization. Right? That's the pretext. We're doing this for democracy, right? Just like this, tens of thousands of demonstrators reached Jerusalem after multi multi-day march to save democracy. Yeah, and noted that free countries must resist it. Uh, Volin's statement said. So of course they're onto it. You know, it, it might be kind of a secret weapon for some time, but eventually someone's going to figure something out when all of a sudden. All these different countries start having organic revolutions uh, aimed at preserving democracy. Okay, the term cover, color revolution has been used to describe a series of mass protests at the beginning of the 21st century that sometimes led to the toppling of regimes in the former Soviet Union, the former Yugoslavia, the Middle East, and Asia. Ecological groups unhappy with the way Vucic's populist regime, regime is, com, is combating widespread pollution in the Balkan state, uh, have been at the forefront of recent protests in Serbia. So it's almost like 
there's a particular group or there's a particular side of the political spectrum uh, that you can easily mobilize and get riled up. In the case of Serbia, ecological groups, right? In the case of um, in the case of Israel, uh, you have a bunch of these type of flags flags that are being flown, right? Uh, the colorful flags, as well as other things. It's always one group that you can basically control like zombies if you just do the right things. This is like a this is like a zombie invasion, essentially. It's a, like a zombie apocalypse. Vucic, I don't know if it's Vukic, Vucic, or Vucic, and other Serbian officials have denounced such protests and alleged uh, they were financed by the West to destabilize the country. No, that's impossible. Independent Belgrade media reported Friday that Russia and Serbia have formed a quote-unquote working group to combat color revolutions. This is concerning because uh, this is what leads to my idea that World War III has been going on for a while. I'm about to show you. It's not just me. I'll show you a U.S. president that said that World War III had begun. That, I'm getting to that. Uh, the group has a task to prevent mass demonstrations and survey opposition Serbian activists, non-governmental organizations, and independent journalists. Uh, the pro-opposition uh, Direct No portal said. Direct No's report uh, cannot be independently verified. Although formally seeking European Union membership, Serbia has refused to align its foreign policies with the 27-nation bloc and has instead strengthened its political, economic, and military ties with Russia and China. So it's as though if you don't go along with them, well, sorry, it looks like there's a uh, revolution going on in your country. Looks like there's mass protests uh, when you don't go along with what we want. The Moscow Times, uh, Russia-led military bloc will not allow color revolutions in post-Soviet countries. Uh, there's some stuff I want to read here that goes into more detail about how this works. A Moscow-led military detachment deployed to uh, Kazakhstan to quell the worst anti-government unrest in the post-Soviet country's history will not allow color revolutions to take place, Russian President Vladimir Putin said Monday. Uh, this was last year, 2022. Putin's remarks came after 2,500 Russian, Belarusian, um, Armenian, Tajik, and Kyr uh, Kyrgyz troops were deployed across Kazakh cities to defend key, key state facilities as part of the collective security Treaty Organization Alliance, or the CSTO. Quote, we will not allow the realization of so-called color revolution scenarios, Putin said during Monday's video conference of CSTO members, according to the state-run RIA Novosti news agency. He accused unidentified, quote-unquote, outside forces of interfering, quote, in the internal affairs of other states. Hmm. So you have to wonder about what's going on in Israel. Is this just uh, inside Israel, you know, to save democracy and to fight for these kind of causes, like the cause of the the multicolor flag? You know, is it just that, or is it being helped by outside forces, especially in light of a whole list of different places that have seen color revolutions? And I'm going to show you why this might be happening right now. We're going to talk about that toward the end of the video. But, uh, I mean, I think you can maybe read between the lines here. Quote, they use well-organized and well-controlled militant groups, including those who have obviously been trained in terrorist camps abroad, Putin said, calling Kazakhstan the, tar the target of international terrorism. So there's some element of these things that are well-organized, uh, well, and it says here going to uh, camps abroad. I don't know exactly what he means, but means by that, because he could be saying, you know, intelligence agencies, foreign intelligence agencies training people to uh, do such things. 
Russian officials and pro-Kremlin media have blamed the West for trying to foment a color revolution in Kazakhstan, a similar reprise voiced during popular uprisings in ex-Soviet Georgia, Ukraine, and Belarus in recent years. Speaking at the CSTO summit, Kazakhstan's president, Kazim Jomart Tokayev, uh, called the week of violence, quote, an attempted coup d'etat. What's going to happen in Israel? If this keeps growing, or if they are successful, is there going to be a coup? Or is there going to be an attempted coup? I, I don't know. It seems like they're uh, pretty intent with what they want. I don't know, but that is the aim, or it seems to have been the aim, of a lot of these things. So, for example, uh, Libya. Let's see. I'm a, Libya. Let's see. I'm hoping to find the part on here where it talks about... Okay, so in the case of Libya, that color that color revolution, it resulted in civil war and the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi. You remember this guy? He's the one that would always wear, like, the aviator sunglasses. I'm going to... Let me see if I can find some picture of them. Muammar Gaddafi. Surely you... <laughs> <laughs> Um, so maybe in that case, it was actually a good thing. <laughs> do, you, do you want someone like this running your country? <laughs> oh my gosh, look at this guy. So may, maybe in some cases, it, it isn't so bad <laughs> if the color revolutions work. Um, okay, so going back. Okay, so an attempted coup d'etat, something that has been successful in other countries. And now we're looking at Israel. Um, the Kremlin also criticized the role of social media, right? And I don't know all the social media out there, but I know that the U.S. Um, has produced really powerful, really big social media platforms. So do you think maybe the U.S. might be somewhat in control of those? In fueling the unprecedented protest in Kazakhstan. Do you remember when the George Floyd protests were going on and Facebook would recommend to you these different uh, like GIF images or things of like, you know, uh, black fists raised to the sky and like little animations of protests and stuff like that? You don't think that that helped uh, a little bit with those protests? The fact that Facebook was totally on your side if you were for the protests and they were providing you all sorts of like little things to use in your posts to help radicalize more and more people around you. Uh, I think social media is pretty, it can be pretty dangerous. And I think that the powers that be understand that and they understand how to weaponize it. Quote, social networks obviously have both good and harmful elements. The task is to take measures to stop the harmful side. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said Monday, quote, it is not new. It's just once again been confirmed by the recent events in Kazakhstan, end quote. Authorities in Kazakhstan shut down Internet access across the country amid nationwide protests last week, with access still limited in major cities for days after the unrest. Putin has been a longtime critic of social media's potential for influencing young people. And uh, yeah, yeah. Who are the people you normally see at protests? Like, yeah, you can see some older people there, but uh, isn't it pretty common to see youth, people that just don't have much going on in their lives? It doesn't look like they have it; they're going in a good direction. Um, probably raised by people that have no values, or, or I don't know, maybe they did have values. But th okay, I'm just gen I'm generalizing too much, but I I don't need to tell you that at any given protest. Probably the majority of people that you're going to see there are people, you know, in their maybe like 30, 20s, 30s, teens, stuff like that. Right? Is that any surprise to you? Social media's potential for influencing young people. 
and has recently taken more aggressive steps to limit the kind of content that can be shared online, slapping multi-million dollar fines on the likes of Google and Facebook, for instance, for refusing to remove content linked to Kremlin critic Alexei, Alexei Nalavny. So maybe they, there was an attempt to try and weaponize something around this guy. Um, Putin, no more color revolutions. Uh, there's a part here I wanted to read. This is from VOA News. The demonstrators were prompted by a fuel price increase, okay, but morphed into broader protest over the country's authoritarian rule. Uh, again, this is talking about Kazakhstan. And that's something that I have personally noticed, that a lot of these protests, uh, not always, but sometimes it'll start out as like something different. But then you get this like dogpiling effect uh, or this snowballing effect where it's like, oh, there's a protest going on. This is the time for us to add our cause to it. And I think that the people that weaponize this understand that. So, for example, let me just give you an example. You have the Iranian protests, and I've covered this on the channel before. Uh, it seems like color revolutions have been uh, have they have attempted to implement color revolutions in Iran. So the 2017 to 2021 Iranian protests um, sparked by the 2016 Cyrus the Great Revolt led to a series of political movements, civil, civil disobedience, online activism, and demonstrations followed by government crackdowns. Da, 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 da. Um, dang, I thought I had this. Uh, whatever. I just know that uh, part of this had to do with, uh, like, water shortage. Oh, here we go. Uh, Kaki saw protest rallies over water and fuel shortages, um, sparking anger by citizens for days. Right? So this was, like, one of the issues. And then suddenly, it morphs into something different, where a couple years later, where is it? It turns into the Masa Amini protests. And this was... Uh, an Iranian girl that was killed in police custody. Uh, she was arrested because she was not wearing the, uh, what's it called? Not burqa, uh, hijab. Iran's mandatory hijab law. So she wasn't wearing it the right way. She was arrested and then killed. And that's like what seems to be the most successful when you have a young person. Like remember the, the video I did just like a week or two ago about the the protests that were going on in France, it had to do with the killing of a 17 um, year old during a traffic stop. He was, a uh, he was from Algeria, I think, I think it was Algeria. And so that rallied the support of like all these immigrants across the country, particularly the youth. Right. Um, so, I see that there's like this tendency where it's just like, it's like when you're starting a fire, you know, um, you, you try and like get it going and, Oh, this one, you know, didn't work. It faded out. Let me try again. I'm going to start on this side of the, the pile. Oh, okay. I got it going here. You know, you just like, you keep, you keep throwing things until something sticks. And it seems like the things that stick the best is like when, when somebody is killed. And so there's a call for justice. This is an outrage, you know, but really, there's something much deeper going on than just that issue. Whether that issue is right or wrong, you know, sometimes I think some of these things could be uh, could be right. But there's something much more devious and large and sinister driving the entire movement. Like there's other motives. And that really shouldn't be a surprise when you go to the protests and you see flags for all different types of things. And it's like, what does this have to do with uh, this, you know, what does this have to do with this killing? This is not, this has nothing to do with uh, gay rights. Why is that? Why is this here? So anyway, um, so here's a video that I did a while ago. Uh, this was October 22nd called did world wars did world war three start on, uh, on this date. Right. And I showed my, uh, ASUs, this is my army dress blues that I still have from the army, show my ribbons because one of these ribbons is for the global war on terrorism. So in other words, a world war on quote unquote terrorism. And it's still ongoing. 
that there hasn't been an end date uh, attached to this yet. So if you served in the military during this period, uh, you receive this ribbon. And let me show you something really interesting that George Bush said. So this is an ABC News Online article, May 6th, 2006. Okay, 2006. So five years. Uh, five years after that initial thing happened on that particular day. U.S. President George, George W. Bush has referred to the War on Terror as World War III during a television interview. Mr. Bush told the CNBC television network that the, ro the revolt of passengers on the hijacked flight da -da -da -da, was the first counterattack to World War III. Quote, unquote. He said he agreed with the description of David Beamer, whose son Todd died in the crash in the Wall Street Journal commentary last month. The act was, quote, our first successful counterattack uh, in our homeland in this new global war, World War III, end quote. Mr. Bush said, quote, I believe that. I believe that it was the first counterattack to World War III. Um, <clears throat> you might remember that... Um, <laughs> uh, there's something else I need to pull up. Hold on. Okay, this article is in the same video. This is from Salon. Uh, this is from October 12th, 2007. Seven countries in five years. Uh, man, the highlights aren't saved, though. While uh, the Bush White House promotes the possibility of armed conflict with Iran... A tantalizing passage of Wesley Clark's new memoir suggests that another war is part of a long-planned Department of Defense strategy that anticipated regime change by force in no fewer than seven Mideast states. So, we know what happened in Afghanistan. We know what happened in Iran or Iraq. And that was as a result of conventional war. But interestingly, um, how many other countries, uh, as a result of color revolutions, also uh, had changes take place and revolutions and overthrows? It's almost like this: the whole thing goes together. Iran, or sorry, <laughs> Afghanistan, Iraq, and then much of the Middle East. Let's go back to this. I think there was a list. Um, <laughs> I might just have to keep reading. So, but this is the first time that a high ranking former military officer has claimed to know that such plans existed. The existence of that classified memo would certainly cast more, de more dubious light, not only on the original decision to invade Iraq because of Saddam Hussein's uh, quote unquote weapons and ambitions. I'm doing the, the quote unquote, but on the current efforts to justify and even instigate military action against Iran. Uh, in A Time to Lead for Duty, Honor, and Country, published by Palgrave Macmillan last month, the former four star general recalls two visits to the Pentagon where the, the terrorist attacks of da 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 following the terrorist attacks of da da da. On the first visit, less than two weeks after da da da, he writes, uh, a quote-unquote senior general told him, we're going to attack Iraq. The decision has basically been made. And then later, uh, oh, it's worse than that, he said, holding up a memo on his desk. Here's the paper of the Office of the Secretary of Defense, at the time Donald Rumsfeld, outlining the strategy. We're going to take out seven countries in five years, and he named them, starting with Iraq and Syria and ending with Iran. By the way, Syria... Uh, has been a victim of the Arab Spring. Not a victim, but a, ca a casualty. They're still grappling with uh, the Arab Spring. There's still civil war going on in Syria. Okay. So we know what happened to Iraq. We know what's going on with Syria. Uh, recently, very recently, uh, there have been organic protests, quote-unquote, happening in Iran over multiple issues, as though someone's trying to get that fire going. 
Uh, he says here the hit list included Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, and Sudan. And I think, I want to say that last time I did a video about this, those countries are on here. Uh, we talked about Libya, so Libya has been uh, taken care of according to this plan. Uh, what else was it? Uh, Lebanon, Somalia, Sudan. Let me just do a quick search. Somalia? No. Sudan? Yes. Libya, Somalia, Sudan. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Lebanon. Um, there have been interesting things going on in Lebanon. Oh, I don't think that, I don't think, let's see, Lebanon. Oh, no, yep. Sustained street demonstrations took place in Morocco, Iraq, Algeria, Lebanon, Jordan, Kuwait, Oman, and Sudan. So interesting how that works out. So again, as we're looking at Israel, um, you know, who's instigating this? I don't know. Uh, could it be Iran and Russia? I don't know. Because certainly by this point, uh, maybe they've figured out how the West does it. Or could it be the West that's doing this? I don't know. Maybe the West doesn't like the direction that Israel's taking. And we're going to talk about that, like I said, a little bit later. But first, okay, this is what I want to do now. Let's read... Um, from the Millennial Messiah, uh, just because Bruce R. McConkie is Bruce R. McConkie has written a lot about the Second Coming, so much so that he's made a book about it, and he quotes scripture. And uh, let's compare what he says here to what's happening in Israel, shall we? Chapter thirty-nine: Jerusalem and Armage Armageddon. Armageddon, Jerusalem besieged. Is it happening right now? I don't know. Jerusalem is the holy city, the city of David, the city of the great king. It is the city where Melchizedek, the king of Salem, the prince of peace, reigned in righteousness and with his people served the Lord in, in spirit and in truth. Jerusalem, captured by David from the Jebusites, became the capital city of Israel and later the capital of the kingdom of Judah. In her environs, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more in her environs the son of god was born in her streets the holy messiah ministered and in, in her temple the witness was born of his divine sonship outside her walls in a garden called gethsemane suffering in agony beyond compare he took upon himself the sins of all men on conditions of repentance outside her walls at a place called golgotha he was nailed to a cross and crucified for the sins of the world outside her walls in a quiet garden he burst the bands of death, arose from, Arimath from, from the Arimathean's tomb, and brought life and immortality to light. Jerusalem, in the day of her sorrow, was sacked by Nebuchadnezzar. My recent video, we were just talking about Tisha B'Av. According to Jewish tradition, it happened on the 9th of the month of Av, which is going to be next week. Conquered by Rome, again, uh, Tisha B'Av, when the, the temple was destroyed put to the torch by Titus. And now for nearly two millenniums, she has been trodden down of the Gentiles and the end of her sorrow is not yet. In the days ahead, some of the faithful will gather again within her walls and shall be, and shall build the promised temple. A temple whose function. Now look at this. This is another part. I, I didn't either. I read before and forgot about, or I just never noticed. According to Bruce R. McConkie, here's a new uh, description or a fact about the future temple. So talking about that temple, he says, a temple whose functions and uses will be patterned after the house of the Lord in Salt Lake City. So as we're looking at the red heifer, as we're looking at the effort to build the third temple, uh, which would look like the second temple, uh, I'm not so sure that that's the plan and that's what's what's being referred to. I think some people have that in their mind that it's like, no, the Jews have to build the third temple. Uh, the Temple Institute is going to be the ones that do it. I don't know. But what I do know is I've looked a lot into the BYU Jerusalem Center and I have to <clears throat> put out the obligatory, it doesn't matter what your BYU professor said, 
Okay, it doesn't matter that we have a non-proselyting agreement in Israel. And as far as I know, there is no such agreement that we can't use that center for whatever we want as long as it's not for proselyting. I have looked up those documents. I've done a video about it. It's here on my playlist called the BYU Jerusalem Center playlist. So those arguments do not hold. They do not. The Lord can create the temple wherever he wants, whenever he wants. <clears throat> and uh, the church is not going to break the law. They're not going to go back on their agreements with the Israeli government. But the Lord, who has all power, can do whatever he wants. And uh, this, this building, the BYU Jerusalem Center, uh, has a lot of miracles associated with it. According to Jeffrey R. Holland, 33 miracles went into the building of this temple. Or I mean this uh, this center, which I think will be a future temple in Jerusalem. And uh, he even almost said as much. He he talked about the fact that the true purpose of the temple we can only dimly see in the future. Something like that. But the quote is in one of these videos. Uh, probably several of these videos. We've looked at the architecture. Uh, we've looked at the dimensions. We lo we've looked at a lot of different things. There's reason to believe that this is more than just a campus for BYU students to have hands-on experience in the Middle East. I'm serious. I'm being completely serious. And it's on the same mountain ridge as the Mount of Olives. It's not on the Mount of Olives proper, but it is on um, the same ridge. So there, here's the ridge right here. You can't really see it in the satellite, but if you go like this, I guess you kind of can. Yeah, you can basically see it. So here's the Mount of Olives. Here's the BYU Jerusalem Center to the north. And this is technically called Mount Scopus. All right. But just keep that in mind as, as we read. So let's read that again. <clears throat> again within her walls and shall build the promised temple, a temple whose functions and uses will be patterned after the house of the Lord in Salt Lake City. Thereafter, two prophets, valiant, mighty witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, will teach and testify and prophesy in her streets for three and a half years, at which time they'll be slain, resurrected, and caught up to heaven. We've talked about this before many times. Some of you disagree, but in this Deseret News article, Mideast Prophecies Wow BYU audience, um, you have Victor L. Ludlow, who is giving some kind of uh, lecture about these things and in his opinion he's not a general authority but i think i tend to agree with what he said here when will the two prophets come to the holy land it's already happening it's a common reality to people in the middle east ludlow said ludlow teaches students at byu jerusalem they are in the right place if they want to meet a general authority the top place to meet one of the brethren is church headquarters the second is provo specifically the missionary training center the third is the Holy Land. Quote, there is something to be felt here. They see, they see them all the time. End quote. Before the Battle of Armageddon can take place, Lolo said a change in the social and economic environment needs to take place. I don't know where he necessarily gets that. Uh, I guess that's just kind of logical. But when you think about the social and economic environment, um, and you think about these protests, do you think maybe that fits pretty nicely? This is all about p power, control, money, and social issues, uh, as attested to by this uh, colored flag right here and then the other ones over here. So I think that that's pretty interesting. And, you know, I've put together a spreadsheet to try and track, and it's going to take time, just like all my other spreadsheets, but try and track visits uh, to Israel from the general authorities. Let me see if I can find it really quick. I think it's under country visits. Yep. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So for example, most recently, Elder Uchtdorf went to Israel. Um, I have here whether they went to the BYU Jerusalem Center or not, who they met with. Uh, the purpose, so in this case, devotionals. Back in 2019, Elder Cook, uh, he met with Chief Rabbi of Norway and Michael Melchior in a semi-annual Jewish Latter-day Saint dialogue. 
I call this on the streets. I call this talking with the people of Israel. Uh, President Nelson, at the beginning of his presidency, him, along with Jeffrey R. Holland, uh, as part of their world ministry tour, they went there. Let's see, October 2017, Elder Del G. Run went to Israel on just... I, I did my best to find out why they were going there. All I know is that he was on church business. Um, October 2016, a year before that, he had Jeffrey R. Holland and Quentin L. Cook. They both went. They met with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the one that is currently in the hot seat uh, in Israel, Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat, former Vice Presidential nominee Joseph Lieberman, and others. Uh, they were there because it was the 175th anniversary of Elder Orson Hyde dedicating the Holy Land. Jeffrey R. Holland, 2015, uh, met with government leaders. Um, and then, no, I have, I have even more. Look, 2015, <clears throat> Elder Neil L. Anderson, he, went, he met with Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat. It was the 2015 International Association of Jewish Gene Genealogical Societies Conference. Gordon B. Hinckley went in 1999. Uh, he also went in 1996. Five Nation European visit, Jerusalem's 3000th anniversary. King David's conquest visited major biblical sites. The Tabernacle Choir uh, went there. They're not prophets, but they have an important role that they play. Uh, they actually are successful at getting people to join the church. People are touched by their music and, and want to know more about the church. Uh, 1989, Howard W. Howard W. Hunter, uh, which at the time he was president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, uh, dedication of the BYU Jerusalem Center, Howard W. Hunter a year before that, the signing of the 49-year lease. And uh, don't get any, any ideas about that. I've been informed by someone that lives in Israel. I'm not going to say who they are. Uh, they talked about how that's a standard uh, thing in Israel. That's not like the church is like, oh, just 49 years will be good. Thank you. No, it's like a typical thing. Okay. Um, 1979, Spencer W. Kimball, he dedicated the Orson Hyde Memorial Garden. And undoubtedly, there's a, a many more trips that I don't have listed here. They go there all the time, and they're meeting with uh, regular people from the street. You know, you have the people that work at the BYU Jerusalem Center that are not members of the church. They meet with people that come to the BYU Jerusalem Center. They meet with city uh, government officials, national officials, uh, all the way up to the prime minister. And they've been doing it for a long time. And uh, I'm not going to repeat again everything about three and a half years, other than the fact that there's a lot of symbolism in the scriptures when it comes to lengths of time. And three and a half generally represents a time when there's apostasy, when Satan has control, rather than a literal three and a half years. So I'm not going to negate what Bruce R. McConkie is saying here, um, but I'm going to keep that open as a possibility, potentially. All right. Okay, resurrect. Okay, da, 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 da. Jerusalem has ascended to the heights and descended to the depths. The, the Lord Omnipotent, who, has, who was and is from everlasting to everlasting, made the dust of her streets holy uh, because the soles of his feet, uh, because of the soles of his feet found footing there. <laughs> the blood of prophets cries from the same dust for vengeance against godless wretches who, uh, to whom innocent blood was of no more worth than sour wine. Jerusalem has been, and yet again, will be destroyed for her iniquities. When Nebuchadnezzar, so it'd be interesting if that happened on Tisha B'Av. When Nebuchadnezzar pillaged and burned and slew, and that's next week, by the way, and slew and carried the Jews into Babylon, it was because they had rejected Jeremiah and Lehi and the prophets. It was because they walked in an evil course. Then Titus tore, tore her asunder, slew most of her citizens, and made slaves of the rest. It was just uh, re it was just retribution because she had crucified her king. And when she falls again amid the horror and brimstone and blood and fire of Armageddon, 
It will be because she has again slain the prophets and chosen to worship Baal and Bel and uh, Merodach and all the idols of the heathen rather than the Lord Jehovah. And I'm telling you, the majority of this group right here are the seculars. They are the ones that support all these different uh, crazy causes and have all sorts of deviations that they're hoping to make reality in society. All right, continuing. Wars, wars come because of sin. Yeah, wars come because of sin. They are born of lust and evil. The great tribulation sent upon the Jews in the days of Titus exceeded anything ever sent of God upon them from the beginning of their kingdom until that time. The tribulations parallel the sins. Sorry, the tribulations parallel the sins. The just one was slain, and the unjust murders were were paid the uh, paid the penalty. So shall it be at Armageddon. The whole world will be wallowing in wickedness. Uh, that's how things are going right now. But Jerusalem will be, as it were, the capital of all the wretched evils of the world. Once again, the cup of her iniquity will be full, and she shall fall as, as she fell before. Then, having been cleansed by blood, she shall rise to become the millennial capital from which the, world, the word of the Lord shall go forth to all the earth. Jehoshaphat, meaning Jehovah Judges, is the valley between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. So, right here, we were just looking at this. It's this valley right here in BYU Jerusalem, BYU Jerusalem, or what I believe is the future temple, overlooks it. It is in this valley that the returning Lord uh, will sit to judge the heathen nations. It's in this valley that he's going to do it. Uh, could it be because there's a building right above that valley that overlooks that valley? Or maybe as the landscape changes here, maybe uh, this will be in the valley or lower. I don't know. It is it is there that the Lord will set his foot when uh, this same Jesus who ascended from all of it returns again. The valley of Megiddo, once Megiddo, meaning place of troops, is part of the plain of Esedralon or plain of Jezreel, which is some 20 miles long and 14 miles wide. It was on the plain of Esedralon that Elijah had his confrontation with the priests of Baal. The valley of Megiddo has been a famous battleground uh, through the centuries. Uh, it is in Samaria, a few miles north of Nazareth of Galilee. Uh, Armageddon is the hill of the valley of Megiddo, west of Jordan on the plain of Jezreel. And Armageddon is the place where the final war will be fought, meaning, as we suppose, that it will be the focal point of a worldwide conflict, and also that, as a place of ancient warfare, it will be a symbol of the conflict that will be raging in many nations and on many battlefronts. Well, uh, if we're in World War III right now, <clears throat> there have been a lot of conventional wars that have taken place, including Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but there's also a lot of unconventional war that's going on, which I believe includes these uh, color revolutions. I think that the weather in some way has probably been weaponized. I think there's a lot of warfare going on that we don't recognize as warfare because it's new. It's what we haven't... We've never had this type of warfare before. Uh, cyber warfare, for example. Having these things in mind, let us just, let us just turn the, to the prophetic word relative to Jerusalem in the final great battle during which our Lord will return. Quote, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. Well, we're going to see what happens in coming days uh, with this situation, but... I think there's a lot of um, chaos and stuff going on over there right now. And maybe it's going to get worse. I don't know. Okay, Armageddon is in process. All nations are at war. Like World War III, what we're potentially in right now. Some are attacking Jerusalem with color, with color revolutions. And others are defending the once holy city. She is the political prize. Political prize. What is this right here? What is this all about? 
it's all about politics. It's about the um, the judicial branch of the government. They don't have a constitution. They just have the Declaration of Independence upon which their legal system is based. And uh, there's these people here that feel like uh, the reforms are going to take away, I think, their power uh, in the judicial system. It's going to go against uh, their causes, potentially, the causes that they uh, are always fighting for. Three world religions claim her, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Emotion, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me. Emotion in fanaticism run high. Yep, uh, they sure are right now. It sure is. If this isn't fanaticism, I don't know what is. Let's go to some of these other pictures. Yep. Okay. Emotions and fanaticism run high. Per perfect condition for a uh, uh, color revolution. It is a holy war, as such have been called throughout the ages. Men are fighting for their religion. L let me show you something about, about Israel that's really interesting. Okay. Jerusalem's Jewish residents becoming more religious. The Central Bureau of, St of Statistics released statistics on Jerusalem's ever diverse population ahead of Jerusalem Day on Sunday. This was uh, May 27th of last year. A majority of Jewish people of Jerusalem is either Haredi, which is ultra-Orthodox, or leads a religious lifestyle, according to a new report by Israel's Central Bureau of Statistics, released ahead of Jerusalem Day. According to the index, 35% of Jerusalem's Jewish residents identify as Haredi, and, uh, <clears throat> and a further 25% consider themselves to be observant Jews, making up a total of 57% of residents who identify as religious. In contrast, fewer than one in five residents, 18%, identify as secular Jews. Jerusalem is the biggest city in Israel with a population of um, just under a million as of 2019, which is 10% of the entire population of Israel, according to uh, data gathered by the Jerusalem Institute. Jews represent a majority in Jerusalem with around 590,000 Jewish residents, according accounting for 61.2 of Jerusalem's population. The Arab population of the capital stands at about 375,000, or 38.8%. Now look at this. This is from Jerusalem Mayor Moshe Lyon. Jerusalem is in the midst of a revolution. Jerusalem is transitioning into a city that has, been, that has more than a wall at its heart. These are kind of like prophetic words, I would say. You know, as we're talking about walls, as we're talking about the state of Israel's spirituality. Lyon also stressed that the city continues to adhere to its quote unquote historical values. Now, these are not the protests. These are this would be like the opposite side of the protest. These are ones that support um, Israel and uh, its presence there. And this is on the other side of the spectrum. So don't get that confused. Um, there's an interesting thing that, that is said here. Now, this guy, he is a leftist. He's secular. Uh, Carlo Stranger, Stranger, Stranger. Why is Israel becoming more religious? And, uh, of course, he puts it all in secular terms. Israel's left has tried for decades to win elections by de-emphasizing security and emphasizing social justice, equality, and solidarity. But this has largely failed for the last 40 years, particularly when it was led by leaders with a strong social agenda like Amir Peretz and Shelley Yesimovich. In a conflict zone like Israel, the right focuses the political agenda on security and national identity, and no amount of social de democratic emphasis can change this. Even, well, unless 
unless you can weaponize protests and uh, force change in your favor so that Israel remains or becomes more secular. And maybe, maybe this is what this is all about. You know, maybe it is the West and they're trying to get Israel to stop going in the religious direction because that's not the way you're supposed to go. You're supposed to become globalists like us and uh, secular. Even the social justice protests of 2011 have hardly made a dent in Israel's march toward the religious Zionist revival. Hence, uh, Avineri's idea simply does not fit historical facts. And then later he says, I'm therefore afraid that neither Avineri's return to labor Zionism nor Livni's call to celebrate Israel's secular culture will bring Israelis back to liberal secularism, which neither provides religious solace uh, nor promises immortality, like religion does. Israel's secular liberals must realize that we are a, min we are a minority, that our cosmopolitan Enlightenment ideals do not satisfy the needs of most Israelis, and that we are unlikely to shape Israel's dominant culture and political identity in the foreseeable future. So here's a secular talking about, look, we're the minority. We can't really change anything here. Uh, the, if anything, the country is becoming more and more religious. So is it any wonder that you have something like this, most likely with outside help going on, that all of a sudden uh, pops up over an issue like this? It's a war. To me, uh, this is war, and it's part of World War III. This is a battle that's part of World War III. Our only choice is to defend the basic tenets of Israel's liberal democracy, to carve out a space where we can live according to our own ideals and values, and to realize that liberal Zionism has lost the battle for Israel's soul against religious Zionist ideology. So men are fighting for their religion. In the case of the seculars, they're fighting for their secular religion. It seems like that this is a component of what's going on here, religion. The religious versus the non-religious. And religious values versus non-religious values. They are in siege against the city of Jerusalem in the land of, in the land of Judah. And in this case, if uh, what's going on right now, if it fits the bill... Uh, yeah, it is actually taking place in Jerusalem and throughout the country. Quote, In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. Yeah, it's kind of been a problem internationally. Uh, a lot of uh, foreign policy and stuff is based on Jerusalem um, and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's kind of been a, a, an issue for the whole world ever since its creation. All that burden, all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. End quote. What, what though all the nations of the earth, what, what though all the nations of the earth come up to battle against Jerusalem, yet in due course, and after the fall of the city and the destruction of the wicked, all shall fail and fall, and their venture shall come to naught. So this little plan right here, if this is the final one, or if or if it's part of like the bigger uh, event in any way, it's just going to fail. We know what we know what's going to happen. Christ is coming. His government is going to be installed. Okay, quote, In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment, and his rider with madness. With madness. So these people riding these vehicles of war, mad, crazy, blind. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. I feel like this is one of the horses of the people the, the color revolution, one of the horses, one of the war machines of the new world war. The warning, 
the warring hosts shall be smitten with madness and a blind rage will overrule all reason. <laughs> Isn't that what, what we talk about so much on this channel? The strong delusion in the world, the just insanity, the craziness, the blindness, the rage, the rage in all these protests throughout the world, including what's going on in Israel. Continuing, men will say, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. And the answering word will be, surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord, Lord God of hosts. If there ever was a group that is, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die, or for tomorrow we die, uh, do you think it's the religious, or do you think it's the seculars? And sorry, I don't mean to think too much in black and white terms. I think this is probably a complex issue, and it could be that what they're trying to do in Israel with the judicial reform, maybe it's not the right way to do it. Maybe it's too extreme. One thing that I will say is uh, even though they're they're abiding by the legal process, where, where is it? Right here. Even though they're going through the legal process in Israel, he was elected, this government was elected, they're doing things according to the law. It may not be the best to ram something down people's throat if there's so much opposition. Although, again, we have to take into into account: would the opposite would the opposition be this big and this strong if it wasn't for outside influence? And we don't know that that's the case. So there's a lot of unknowns here. Anyway. How will the battle go, and who will come off victorious? What chance for life will any have, considering the destructive power of the weapons then in the hands of the madmen who command the armies? Like, uh, color revolutions? The Yeah. In, in answer, we are told, quote, It shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. There's that uh, verbiage of parts. You know, again, people always assume, oh, that means that exactly 33% will remain. And I don't think that that's what's being communicated here. And I don't think that in the pre-existence, you know, a third part of the host of heaven followed Satan. I don't think that that means specifically 33%. I think it's categories. You know, so one category. In this case, two categories therein shall be cut off. I think it that, that's just my opinion, though. This is Israel of whom he speaks. Uh, these are the armies of who are defending Jerusalem and who cause, in the eternal sense, it's just. Or is, and, and whose cause, in the eternal sense, it's just. Those who are defending Jerusalem. Okay. And, and the side defending Jerusalem, at the, who is attacking at this point? Who are the ones that are marching on the city, um, possibly going to commit a coup, uh, which that might be a little bit too, um, I might be jumping the gun there. But who's on the attack and who's on defense here between this war between the religious and the non-religious? Two thirds of them shall die. Quote, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call upon my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. We repeat, it is a religious war. The forces of Antichrist, ah, uh, the forces of Antichrist are seeking to destroy freedom and liberty and right and they seek to deny men the right to worship the Lord. They are the enemies of God. The one-third who remain in the land of Israel are the Lord's people. They believe in Christ and accept Joseph Smith as his prophet and revealer for the last days. But what of the wicked among the defenders of Jerusalem? Uh, they shall be destroyed. Quote, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Remember, this is Armageddon, and all the nations of the earth are at war. 
And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the, t- of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So shall it be with Jerusalem when she falls again. Let's read this over again because there, there's one thing that I failed to mention. Okay, so, and I will bring up the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call upon my name, and I will hear them. Uh, I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. We repeat, it is a religious war. The forces of Antichrist are seeking to destroy freedom and liberty and right. They seek to deny the men, d- deny men the right to worship the Lord. They are the enemies of God. The one-third who remain in the land of Israel are the Lord's people. They believe in Christ and accept Joseph Smith as his prophet and reveler, revealer for the last days. I don't know that he's saying that, you know, one third of Israel is going to be members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but that they will believe Christ when he comes. I, I'm I'm pretty sure that's what he's saying. But there's one thing to keep in mind when it says that they shall call upon my name and I will hear them. We have to remind ourselves that uh, it's not just Jews that are in Israel. Uh, there are Christians, but... Among the Christians, there are people that were Jews that converted to Christianity, and it's called the Messianic Jewish Movement. And I've talked about them a number of times. In fact, I have them here on my uh, Second Coming timeline. You see column M over here at the far right. The Messianic Jewish Movement has actually been going on since just a little bit before the first vision. If you go to the beginning of it, and back in those days, it was classified as the Hebrew Christian movement. The first main event that I have here was the London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews. Approximate beginning of the Hebrew Christian movement, just 11 years before the first vision. And then seven years before the first vision, the first identifiable congregation made up exclusively of Jews who had converted to Christianity. Benny Abraham, established in the United Kingdom. So it's interesting that at the same time with Joseph Smith, the Messianic Jewish movement uh, takes off. And now, you know, it, it runs all the way until today. And right now in Israel, it says the number of Messianic Jews in Israel is estimated to be about 20,000. They are mostly classified as being uh, without a religious affiliation, rather than being classified as either Jewish or Christian. So it's probably hard to really estimate it, but, okay, so about 20,000, and according to Jer- the Jerusalem Post, how many Israeli Jews believe in Jesus? New book sheds light. And at the first part of this article, it says, there are nearly 300 Messianic fellowships in Israel, according to a book published this month by Kaspari Center in Jerusalem. So there is a number of uh, Jews in Israel that have converted to Christianity, and they're called Messianic Jews. So I can't help but to think about them uh, at this part, where it says, They shall call upon my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people. And then we know that there is going to be a mass conversion of the Jews when Christ comes to them. Um, Another thing to think about, kind of going back to this idea of... um, Israel becoming more and more religious. There's a couple articles, the Jerusalem Post, Israel at 75, Zionism is becoming more religious, linked with Judaism. Okay, and of course, okay, I thought I had some highlights here, maybe it was in this next one. Young Israeli Jews are mostly right-wing, increasingly religious. Survey. Gosh dang it, I had highlights. The majority of young Israeli Jews between ages 15 to 24 define themselves as right-wing, and a growing number of them are religious, a study published Thursday said. 67% of Jewish youth define themselves as right-wing, or center-right, while just 16% consider consider themselves to be left-wing, in findings from a survey of Israeli youth, 
by the Macro Center of Political Economics and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation cited Thursday in a Yediot Aharonot report. Um, in Israel, as Israel matures, Zionism is morphing and adopting a more religious tone than its secular founders. Was this inevitable? Should it be stopped? No. How can we adapt? Um, yeah, maybe I don't know if I did have highlights on this one, but the fact is, is that um, Israel is becoming more religious. The youth, uh, in particular, are becoming more religious, uh, which is opposite uh, what you find in Western countries, uh, it, mostly. Uh, so that's really interesting. You know, it's like the time has come. And even though some of them, uh, most like these Israeli Jews, they're they're Jewish, um, the ones that are genuine, that are doing it for the right reason, that actually value truth, when Christ comes, they will accept him. So you have the Messianic Jews, you have uh, the Jews in the country that are becoming more religious. So it's an interesting time in Israel's history, and as we're reading through this. Okay. But what of the fate of those who fought against her? In spite of her fall, Jerusalem will be victorious. Though she is taken and pillaged and her women, her women ravished, yet in the end she will become victorious. As to her, her enemies, the account says, quote, As this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem, their flesh shall consume away <coughs> excuse me, while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall be consumed away in their holes, and their tongue shall be consumed away in their mouth. End quote. Already, Men has created weapons that will have this very effect upon those whom the death-dealing powers are sent forth. And lest any assume that the ancient world shall not be fulfilled in the full and literal sense, the Lord in our day acclaims, quote, I, the Lord, will send forth flies upon the face of the earth, which shall take hold of the inhabitants thereof, and shall eat their flesh, and shall cause maggots to come in upon them, and their tongues shall be stayed, that they shall not utter against me. And their flesh shall fall from off their bones, and their eyes from their sockets. And it shall come to pass that the beasts of the of the forest and the fowls of the air shall devour them up. That's nice. These things boggle the mind and dull our sensitivities. We can sincere we can scarcely conceive the full horror of what is involved, and what we do, and what we do envision shall be only the beginning of sorrows, as it were. Quote, and it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. Uh, it is as though the whole world shall become one great arena of anarchy. Yeah, uh, color revolutions, part of that. But just everyone arguing over politics and social issues and f public freakouts and all this different stuff all throughout the world. It is just anarchy. It is anarchy. We are living that right now. Um, with every man wielding his own sword and seeking to betray and slay his brother. And Judah also shall fight in Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be defended manfully, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall the plague of the horse, of the mule, of the camel, and of the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in these, in these tents as this plague. Uh, man and beast alike shall suffer and die, and the whole earth shall be one great Gehenna, or Gehenna, where the worms and rats and creeping things feast on the carcasses of the slain. Jewish conversion and cleansing. Out of Armageddon will come will come great blessings in the eternal sense to those Jews who Jews and others who abide the day. See, to Jews. And in that day, when all the nations are gathered together against Jerusalem, and she has become a cup of trembling unto all the people, shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. This is the day when two shall put their uh, tens of thousands to flight, when divine intervention will scatter the hosts of the wicked, 
when in weakness and by faith of the Lord's people will, will wax valiant and put to flight the armies of the aliens. And it shall come to pass that in that day uh, that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, saith the Lord. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. The, ba the battles will be fought by the warriors of the earth, but the Lord's hand will be in it. Uh, it shall be with the defenders of Jerusalem as it was with Gideon and his 300 soldiers when they were when they put the Midianites to flight. It shall be as when Samson burst the cords with which he was bound, found a new jawbone of an ass, and with it slew thousand Palestinians. It shall be as when Israel prevailed over the armies of Amalek, uh, as long as Aaron and Hur held up the hands of Moses, the Lord will fight for Israel as he fought times without number for them during the long hours of their sorrow and travail. And then he shall come in person. So it makes it seem like... <sighs> that makes it seem like there's going to be like a sudden miracle taking place where the war is uh, starts going the other way. And uh, Israel and the righteous start to have victory and, and then he says here and then he shall come in person the great god shall appear and his feet shall stand in that day upon the mount of olives which is before jerusalem on the east and the mount of olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west and there shall be a very great valley uh, and half of the mountain shall be removed shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south again i would take this very seriously how in turkey earlier this year olive grove earthquake how we actually saw a literal mount of olives uh in turkey split in two <laughs> it still just blows my mind the shaking of the earth's surface was so violent it created a canyon in a pe in a peaceful olive grove that is roughly more than 130 feet deep 900 feet wide and more than more than a mile long the 7.8 earthquake quite literally split the village of uh tepehan in two and there it is right there oh my gosh i feel like that's a, a pretty clear sign that that's literally going to be happening in jerusalem soon uh, this shall be part of the upheavals which cause every valley to be exalted and every mountain to be made low. This shall be the immeasurably great earthquake foreseen by John and spoken of by the prophets. Then, with reference to the people, the account continues, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And further, with reference to the people, meaning those who remain, uh, for by this time the wicked will have been destroyed by the plagues and the war and the burning. With reference to the people, the Lord says, And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. Lo, at long last the Jews shall, shall turn to their Messiah and believe in him who was born of Mary in Bethlehem of Judea. They will supplicate the Lord their God in the name of Christ, who is the Deliverer, even as their forebears did, and the Lord will hear their cry. They will pray to the Father in the name of the Son, having faith in Christ, uh, to gain the witness, born of the Spirit, that the Book of Mormon uh, is the mind and will and voice of the Lord to a fallen world. So see, th I think this is what he was talking about before, that, part, that third part of uh, Jerusalem that will recognize joseph smith and that he was a prophet it's like after it's like once christ once christ comes they will come to know by the revelations of the holy spirit of god that the book of mormon is a jewish book in a book that deals with jews who went from jerusalem in the days of zedekiah king of judah of course he's talking in the broad sense we know that they were from the tribe of manasseh and there seems to be well never mind uh, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Um, 
the pierce the pierced one appears the prophet of nazareth of galilee stands before them the carpenter's son whom they rejected comes in immortal glory now they know whether now they know whether any good can come out of nazareth and whether a true prophet shall rise from galilee the river side of the the, the riven side of the son of man retains the wound whence came blood and water as his dead body hung on the cross of calvary and one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then shall then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. O oh, what sorrow, what mourning, what wailing shall shall rise in that day from the lips of all men in all nations, from all who have not made Christ the true Christ their king. How the Jews will mourn because they crucified their king. What sorrow will be in their hearts of the what sorrow will be in the hearts of the Mohammedans uh, because they claimed him as one of the prophets and denied his divine sonship. What tears uh, will water the faces of all those whose fathers bequeathed false forms of worship to them? And how the Christians will wail, wail until it will seem their very souls shall dissolve into nothingness. For they, favored above all the kindreds of the earth, had the holy scriptures and could read the words of the ancient prophets and the holy apostles, and yet they did not believe the true gospel of the lowly one uh, by whom salvation came. And Jesus said on all of it, Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And this is something that was recently referenced by uh, President Nelson. Let me just, I think it's it bear, it's worth reading again. Um it's from Overcome the World and Find Rest. Glory. So this was the October 2022 General Conference. And he referenced uh, what we just read, the, the sign of the Son of Man. President Nelson says, between now and the time he returns, quote, with power and great glory, end quote, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. And he says before that, But my dear brothers and sisters, so many wonderful things are ahead. In coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power the world has ever seen. And maybe part of that is because uh, if this is the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem, if it is the siege of Jerusalem, if um, this is World War III that's going on and Israel is about to be destroyed uh, so to speak, um, politically and by its enemies, uh, by those that are not religious. And, and even worse, if, uh, if the other side, you know, cause my, my best guess is that this is happening at the hand of the globalists that want to turn, make sure that Israel, uh, stays as secular as possible, or maybe even reverse things. So, um, <clears throat> it, again, it'd be interesting if the other side, which is Russia and Iran, uh, but specifically Iran, uh, Russia has its hands tied up in Ukraine. If Iran decided that this is the time to uh, attack when there's all this division, uh, potentially, very potentially civil war going on, you see how things could go pretty crazy pretty fast. That's why, you know, I'm making this big, long video about this, because I think it's worth noting and um, considering that this could be it, or it could be the beginnings of it. Zechariah himself, a Jew, in writing to the Jews and speaking of his own nation, said, They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness, be bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. How apt is this language? The only Son of God, the firstborn of the Father, is the one who was slain. If men mourn over the loss of an only Son, who who is their heir and firstborn? How much more ought they to mourn for the firstborn and heir of the Father, his only Son, who, having come to bring salvation, was rejected and crucified by his friends? In that day uh, shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of had a driven in the valley of Megiddon. 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 And the land shall mourn, every family apart, 
the family of the house of David apart and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart and their wives apart, the family of uh, Shimei apart and their wives apart, and the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. Then shall be fulfilled that which is written, Behold, he cometh with with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they shall all, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall be shall wail because because of him. We have received the revelation on amplified account of what the Lord Jesus said in the great Olivet discourse of his return to the Jews, which we are which we are here considering. His holy word says. Then shall the arm of the Lord fall upon the nations, and then shall the Lord set his foot upon his mount, and he shall cleave in twain, and the earth shall, tre- shall tremble, and reel to and fro, and the heavens also shall shake, and the Lord shall utter his, his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it, and the nations of the earth shall mourn, and they that have laughed shall see their folly, and calamity shall cover the mocker, and the scorner shall be consumed, and they that have watched for iniquity shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. And, we, and, uh, and that makes me think of the crowd that's like always like cheering on whatever the next new abomination is that they're trying to get legalized. You know, watching for iniquity. Oh, can we get this done? Can we make this normal? Can we legalize this? You know, that's what I think about. Um... And then shall the Jews look upon me and say, What are these wounds in thine hands and thy feet? Then shall they know that I am the Lord. For I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who is lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. And then shall they weep because of their iniquities, and they shall lament because they persecuted their king. In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. A fountain, a fountain, sorry, a fountain, the cleaning fountain, the fountain of the Lord. What is it? It is a baptismal font, possibly at the BYU Jerusalem Center. The house of David, well, no, because that would be turned into, I don't know, just whatever. I'm getting tired now. The house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the upright and noble in the nations, good men at the ends of the earth and among every kindred, All shall be baptized for the remission of sins. All shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of fire, uh, which burns dross and evil out of human soul. You know what? I'm done. (laughs) This is going way longer than I thought. I'm sorry. I know a lot of you want me just to be concise in all this stuff, but I wouldn't be able to do as as much work if I had to put it all down concisely, but there there's more. You can read the rest of it. This is on archive.org. It's a free library. You just free to send, you sign up for a free account, and then you can access all these books, including a lot of um, books like this written by the apostles or general authorities. So um, it's all just very interesting. We literally had a Mount of Olives that was cleaved in twain. Uh, The Israelis are becoming more religious, which is a problem for the seculars. The seculars are uh, rising up, uh, most likely, in my mind, with the help of outside influences. I think what we're seeing here is a colored revolution, uh, which I'm not so sure that we've seen in Israel up until this point. If there has been, none of them have definitely been as big as this. The only uprising that I can think of in Israel uh, were the intifadas by the Palestinians. So like at the, like at the beginning of this uh, century and millennium. We're going to have to keep a close eye on this and see what happens over the next couple weeks. Uh, I'm not going to put any limits, limits on it. This could be the beginning of the end. And it's not going to be until afterwards that we're able to see clearly how all prophecy was actually fulfilled. Let's see. just want to see if there's any, it's not letting me update it. Let's see. I just want to see if there's any new updates. Seven minutes ago, IDF chief to reportedly speak with 
uh, Prime Minister about revert reservist protests impact on IDF. Uh, IDF Chief Hertzi Halevi is expected to speak tomorrow with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu about the growing number of re reservists suspending their volunteer service to protest the, judi the judicial overhaul and the expected impact on military readiness, according to Hebrew media reports. 25 minutes ago, over 200,000 estimated to be taking part in nationwide rallies against overhaul. 38 minutes ago, reservist protest group announces 10,000 reserve troops to stop volunteering. Uh, at a press conference in Herzliya, members of the Brothers in Arms protest group announced that 10,000 reserve soldiers they represent will stop showing up for volunteer duty to protest the judicial. Oh, this is bad. The reserve soldiers join over 1,000 Israeli Air Force reservists and others who have similarly suspended their volunteer service or threatened to do so. So that's a big increase because first it was 1,000. And earlier in this video, it was 500 uh, reservists in intelligence, like uh, military intelligence. And now uh, 10,000. Oh my gosh. Uh, 51 minutes ago, Lapid Netanyahu needs to choose if he prefers IDF or reasonableness bill. Oh, so there's an ultimatum, huh? That that's how that's how democracies work. Uh, you, an elected official, and everybody else that's elected, you better choose. Otherwise, you have to choose one or the other. <laughs> it's either we all die because the military stops fighting or you do what we want. Oh my gosh. Um, Prime Minister said determined to pass reasonableness law as planned this week unless compromise deal. Okay, that's nothing new. One hour ago, around the time that I started this video, but more actually, uh, marchers reach Knesset, hold protest against judicial shakeup. And this is Tel Aviv. We already saw that. All right. I don't know. Make of it what you will. I'm open to all possibilities. I'm open to the possibility that this is not the siege. I'm open to the possibility that it is the siege or that it leads to the final siege or it's a key event in the final war. Just things to think about. That's all. That's going to be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. So make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.